Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to talk about classification, but before we do that, I want to remind you that all the stuff you need is in the module folder in classification. So there are labs there, there are activities for you to turn in and do there, and there's a study guide. Make sure that you don't wait till the last minute to do your work. So this can become overwhelming if you wait till the last minute. So I encourage you to, you know, have good study habits and pick a time and stick to that time that you're going to do your reading and your studying. Also make sure you know there's a PowerPoint uh, outline there that you can print out. I do six slides per page and there are things that are blanked out so you don't get a complete set of notes unless you watch the lecture and fill in your notes as we go along. And as always, you can always email me if you need help with um, any particular thing. So let's go ahead and we'll start talking about classification today. So taxonomy is the science of naming and classifying organisms. So, you know, one day you could be a taxonomist and that would be a person that would describe organisms and how they're uh, identified. Additionally, there is systematics and this is the science of identifying evolutionary relationships between organisms. So we'll talk about each one of these different sciences today. And as you can see over here on the right hand side, there's a whole scheme here of how we identify the cheetah here. And, uh, and we put it into a classification system to communicate information. So Linnaeus, uh, you know, many years ago uh, was the uh, person who devised our current system that we put organisms in, into. So he devised this, uh, this classification system where we have kingdoms, phylums, classes, orders, family, genera, and species. So kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And every organism is put into this particular classification system. So I want you to think for a minute of a mnemonic. That's a, a little learning device that you can use to help you remember the levels of classification in order. Per perhaps you're familiar with Roy G. Biv, and this is a mnemonic that we use to do the colors of the rainbow. So mnemonics, you know, the weirder they are, the stranger they are, the better they'll oftentimes work. So think of something weird, think of a sentence, something that rhymes, something that's crazy, to help you to remember the levels of, levels of classification in order from the highest level kingdom all the way to the lowest level the species so you can stop the video for just a second and jot down a couple of ideas you have after that I'll share with you a few that uh, that I've created or seen students do in the past so here's one that you can remember uh, pretty easily kids playing catch on freeways go splat if you close your eyes and imagine that it's horrific but maybe it'll stick in your mind so each of the letters represents the first letter of the classification scheme. So kids is for kingdom, playing P for phylum. So kids playing catch on freeways go splat. I've seen people use King Philip cuts open five green snakes. That's kind of more of a traditional mnemonic to learn the order and um, sequence. Kids pouring chlorine on friends get smacked. So whichever one of these might work for you, maybe yours was good and, and you would uh, like to use yours. Um, so whichever one works for you would be great with me. So every organism is put into this classification scheme. So for example, if we look at the lion over here, it's in the kingdom Animalia. It's in the phylum Chordata, so it's a chordate. It's in the class Mammalia. It's in the order Carnivora. It's in the family Felidae, the genus Panthera, and its genus species name is Panthera Leo. So why do you think we uh, use a classification system? What's the point of even doing that? So I want you to take and research two other species, and you can imagine on a test, coming in for a test for me, that I would ask you to write the complete classification of one organism. So if you practice two, maybe one of them will stick in your mind a little bit better. Yeah, so uh, you can practice that. You can stop the video and practice that or practice that after finishing up the lecture. Now, don't think I'm not going to ask you. I will ask you that on the test. So it's always shocking to people that, um, that that's asked. But um, it's on your study guide, and we talked about it in notes. And if it's in the notes and it's in the study guide, you can be assured that it's probably going to be on the test. So binomial nomenclature is the system of making a two-part name for all organisms that are on Earth. Every living thing is given a two-part name, a genus name and a species name. For example, just a couple of organisms in this area, Quercus alba means white oak. 
And this Quercus alba looks probably strange to you because it is uh, is written in Latin and uh, and using Greek uh, words. So Quercus and alba. Quercus means oak and alba means white. And so the first person to describe it said, hey, the thing looks white and it's an oak. So I'm going to call it Quercus alba. Um, Ambistema maculata means spotted salamander. So again, this, this actually doesn't look like it means anything, but the first people to write these scientific names tried to describe something about the animal using the Latin or Greek uh, root words. There are rules for scientific naming, and I want you to know these rules. The first one is that the genus name always starts with a capital letter. Okay, The species name is uh, lowercase. You always use italics uh, for the scientific name if it's typed. If you handwrite a scientific name, you underline the genus and the species name. The genus can be abbreviated if it's already used once in the text. So if you look at a scientific paper, um, they'll, they'll show you the name of it one time and then they'll abbreviate it every other time after that, just to be concise. Here's a couple of, uh, of, uh, of scientific names that I'm uh, kind of curious about or interested in. Chelydra serpentina means tortoise snake. So when someone caught the snapping turtle, this is a snapping turtle I caught in a, in a uh, marsh in Emporia, Virginia. I like to do a lot of turtle trapping. It's one of my areas of interest. And uh, so this particular thing, it looks like a tortoise, like a turtle, but it also looks like a snake because of its long tail and head. So someone called it tortoise snake or Chelydra serpentina. I think this is the biggest one I've ever caught before. And uh, this one weighed probably somewhere in the 30 to 40 pound range. But uh, snapping turtles get very big in our area. And uh, if you notice, they do have massive claws. I'm trying to point to it here for you to see. But they have massive claws for climbing on the bottom of the water. And they have a huge head. It is important that you hold it by the tail and leg because that head is so long, you can, if you hold it by the shell, it can reach back and grab you. And uh, that's, um, you know, that's a pretty powerful animal that you don't want grabbing a hold of you. So which two species of reef sharks are most closely related? Okay, so if you look at these particular reef sharks, is the black tip reef shark, the white tip reef shark, or Caribbean reef shark, which ones are more closely related to each other? How do you know that? Yeah, so if you look at the genus name, they both share a genus name in common, and this one actually doesn't. So this refers to them being more closely related than they are to the white tip reef shark. So different genus um, it means that they are going to be more different. Same genus means they're more evolutionarily closely related to each other. So why is it important to name things with a scientific name? Yeah, you probably can think of the reason. And so, like, if you discovered a new plant that uh, was a cure for cancer, you would want to, in the scientific literature, be able to communicate that information with anybody in the world. And if you use some kind of common name, maybe people in China or in Europe don't understand what that means. But if we use a common language, then we can communicate commonly with everybody or else, else in the world. So that's why we use scientific names. Now, I have a little naming activity I want you to try. And uh, I'll put a link on um, inside of the classification folder where you can submit your work for this. But I want you to take, and uh, after you watch this lecture, and on a blank piece of paper, I want you to sketch out a new organism to science. And I want you to name it scientifically. So this organism that you sketch can be fictitious. It can be a mixture of already existing organisms, whatever you want to do. You can create a plant, an animal. Um, it makes no difference to you. But um, I want you to, uh, to practice naming it scientifically. So remember, scientific names are Latinized, so you want to make sure to use some online resource um, to help you find Latin uh, or Greek root words that will help you to name your organism. Now remember, you want to follow the rules that we just looked at. So to have a two-part name, the genus name will be capitalized, the species name will be lowercase, it'll be underlined since you're probably going to do this um, uh, on, you just use a white piece of paper and write it out. If you want to draw online, that'd be fine. The only thing is, is that when you submit uh, work uh, to Blackboard, it has to either be in PDF format, Microsoft Word, or PowerPoint. So if you want to take and sketch it out on white paper and take a photograph of it, you can take that photograph and just copy and paste that photograph over into a Word document and then put it over uh, in Blackboard for me to see. 
you know, when you submit things online, make sure you put your name and make sure you put uh, that this is Bio 102 online. So make sure you put your first name and last name so it's easy for me to check it and uh, grade it. If you have any questions about that, let me know. I'd be happy to help you. I'm kind of curious to see uh, what uh, organisms you uh, create. But again, the, the activity is about not about your drawing ability, but it's about, you know, just uh, doing something creative and, uh, and uh, making sure you name it scientifically using the rules that we have covered so far. Now we're going to talk about in the course of this class all different kinds of organisms. Now we've already talked about some Archaeans and we've talked about bacteria. But in future lectures, we're going to talk about uh, protists, and we're going to talk about fungi, and we're also going to talk about plants, and then one of my favorite topics is uh, animals. So we'll be talking about the classification of all these organisms. It's important that you understand, you know, the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species classification, because we will talk about kingdoms and phylums and classes and orders, and uh, perhaps even some uh, genus and genera and species as well. Now there is a system that's higher than the three do than the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species system, and this is the domain system. So in 1990, uh, we basically had a paper that came out uh, by Carl Woese and colleagues, and uh, and they basically did some uh, testing of uh, of RNA and discovered that there's actually three domains of organisms. There's three major classifications or groupings of organisms that are higher than kingdoms. So we have domain archaea, domain bacteria, and then we have domain eukarya. And these organisms are distinctly different from each other, but they do share common ancestry, therefore common parts. Okay, so this would be the system that's the most current system that we use, but we still use kingdoms and phylums and, and all those other uh, classification schemes as well. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about cladistics. Cladistics is the classification technique that creates an evolutionary tree of uh, groups of organisms. And uh, so this over here is a character table that I'm pointing to. Um, and uh, you can see that they use characters like hair, amniotic shell or a shelled egg, four walking legs, jaws. They use vertebral column or backbone. Now, if the organism has this particular characteristic, you put a 1. If it ha doesn't have this characteristic, you put a 0. So in this table, you know, the lancet, which is, uh, which is a very primitive uh, type of chordate or animal with a backbone, is going to uh, have no hair. So we put a 0 there. Of course, lamprey, which are jawless fish, have no hair. Tuna have no hair. Salamanders have no hair. Turtles have no hair. But leopards do have hair, so you put a 1 there. So for each of these characters, you go through and you fill out the character table. So we can take the character table and then transform it into a cladogram, which is kind of like a, a graph of, uh, of what that would look like. So you can see over here on the character table that uh, we have the lancelet, we have the lamprey, tuna, salamander, turtle, and leopard, and then we put each of our characters there and we begin to separate them out based on their characteristics. Okay, so we can see that uh, the lancelet is an outgroup. It really doesn't have any of the characteristic that we've talked about before, but uh, starting with vertebral column and moving up to uh, different characteristics, each of these species separates themselves out. Okay, so this allows us to show very quickly how these creatures are related to each other, how they share common ancestors with each other, and uh, how they're different from each, with each other. So cladistic analysis um, involves examining suits of, uh, of ancestral and derived characteristics. And uh, so ancestral characteristics would characteristics that they got from ancestors. Derived characteristics would be highly or newly evolved adaptations that these creatures might have. And uh, when we look at these uh, ancestral and derived characteristics, we construct a diagram. And uh, this shows, tries to show evolutionary relationships between the groups. And this is what a cladistic analysis actually is. Cladograms are often drawn using sequences of DNA or amino acid sequences. So we, we can use char physical characteristics or we can use characteristics such as um, DNA or amino acids to make these cladograms. The goal uh, is to create a diagram where all members of the analysis are descended from a single common ancestral species for which all descended species uh, are included. We call that a monophyletic group. 
So currently today, we're trying to put all creatures in these cladograms where they all share common uh, ancestors, and that would be called a monophyletic group. And this could be quite hard because sometimes characteristics, at least uh, physical characteristics, sometimes they can independently involve in different groups that aren't related, so it kind of fakes people out. That's why today we're trying to use more DNA and amino acid sequences in addition to uh, structural characteristics to help us to, to draw accurate cladograms. A clade is a group of organisms that have evolved from a common ancestor, and I'll show you a clade in uh, just one second. So here's a character table for uh, fish, reptiles, monkeys, apes, and humans, and the characteristics are four legs, fur, no tail, uh, and uh, bipedal locomotion. So if you were to draw this particular graph, it would look something like this. So a simple cladogram using those characteristics would look like this. So of course fish have, don't have four legs, so we have them as an out group here. But um, creatures that do have four legs include the reptile, the monkey, and the apes. Um, so has fur, separates out monkeys from reptiles, has a tail, apes from uh, other creatures, and then bipedal locomotion, you have humans here on the outside edge. Notice that these, uh, this is a simple cladogram. It uses the characteristics that we saw in our, in our, um, our character table that we showed before, and, uh, and it does show common ancestry. So there is a common ancestor between fish, reptiles, monkeys, and apes, and there's a common ancestor between reptiles and monkeys and apes and humans. And apes and humans have a common ancestor, and these are places that we will call, uh, these nodes right there are, uh, make up the clades that you can see. So for example, this is a clade right here. But this is also a clade showing common ancestry of all species. Some clades are big and some clades could be small. Now we have to be very careful building a tree using physical characteristics. Why do you think that's necessary that we're careful about that? Yeah, right. So, um, so we have to be careful because, again, things evolve in different locations. Things can evolve similar characteristics. So we have to be real careful when we're building these physical trees that we use as much information as possible, such as DNA, uh, amino acid sequences, and also physical characteristics to build the most uh, um, accurate tree uh, that is possible. These trees do change. I mean, that's what's uh, the nature of science. Science always adapts and adjusts based on uh, finding out new information. So this is just another, showing you another cladogram, uh, allowing you to see the cladogram for um, turtle, horse, wolf, leopard, domestic cat. Here they use hair, carnivorous, meat-eating, retractable claws, and ability to purr as uh, separating characteristics. Now, there are structures, you have to be real careful, there are structures that are similar because of common ancestry, and we call these homologous structures. So you can see here in this little uh, chart here that these homologous structures that lizards, birds, whales, and humans all share in common, this in this chart here would be the, uh, the pentadactyl um, or, or five-member um, arm. So we have a humerus, we have uh, an ulna, a radius, we have carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. These five common bones are found in all these uh, animals, and we see that they're in these common animals because they share common DNA sequences. That's what makes these structures homologous, is the, the instructions to build them are within the DNA. So even, you know, a bird has a humerus, an ulna, a radius, it has carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. And they're shaped a little differently because a bird flies, a human swims, it climbs. Now a whale swims, so it has, uh, you know, a li limbs that are uh, flattened out so that it can create a paddle so it can swim, but the bones are still there in place. And it's shaped a little differently, maybe some different numbers of bones, but they're all there, and uh, the lizard's the same, reason, the same thing. Now you can take any uh, any uh, part of a human uh, heart, and that's not unique to a human. Apes have hearts, and uh, and you know birds have four chambered hearts just like us. So um, um, that's that study of all those common parts would be called uh, comparative anatomy. Now we have to be careful because there are these things called analogous structures, and these structures are similar in the way that they look, but they are not um, derived from a common ancestor. So 
So you can see an, uh, an octopus has a tentacle, which is an arm-like appendage. A sea star has a ray. And then a grasshopper has a leg. Now these things are not derived from common ancestry. These things are derived because this is what ha happens. The uh, convergent evolution has, has created these structures so these organisms can, um, can move around. Another uh, example of, a, of an analogous structure would be like the flies of a wing, the wings of a fly, excuse me, and the wings of bats and birds. Those things are, um, are going to be considered to be analogous structures. So the wings of a fly and the wings of the bird are analogous. They don't, they're not derived from an evolutionary um, common ancestor, but they're derived from uh, adaptations to being able to fly. So we have a, a wing of a bird and a wing of a bat. These would be these two structures would be uh, common to each other from a common ancestor because they're the pentadactyl limb. But the wings of a bird and the wings of an insect are analogous structures. Um, they're derived just because of convergent evolution shaping organisms to exploit flying through the air. And this is just a big cladogram. So cladograms can be big, they can be small, and this is kind of the cladogram now that uh, we have for um, for vertebrates. Uh, well, at least um, creatures that are within the vertebrate grouping. So these are jawless fish all the way up to mammals, and it just shows you how they're related. These are all the characteristics that they use to um, to build this um, this cladogram. So cladograms are mostly based on DNA sequences. That's what you're going to see today. And they're also based on amino acid sequences that are found in proteins. We have software applications, kind of like what you used in the uh, virus uh, activity that we did early on. And uh, these will align sequences of DNA. You can have you know, uh, 10 different species that you're looking at sequences from. And they'll align them into a pattern and show you how um, they'll actually build a tree that looks like this. And you've done this, so you know what I'm talking about. So, um, so these organisms all here are creatures that uh, they built this cladogram for. And if you notice that uh, there is the, are these little branching points called nodes. These little branching points are speciation events. So here's a speciation event here, and this is a speciation event here. So these nodes denote where two or more species have diverged from each other. Now, species may evolve over time to form new species. Uh, consequently, there are groups of species derived from a common ancestor. Such groups are called clades. So clades can be small, as you're seeing over here. Clades can be large, okay, if they contain, uh, as long as they contain um, species that uh, share a common ancestor, you can call it a clade, okay. So if, um, if, a, uh, if a, a species doesn't share a common ancestor necessarily, it'll be an outgroup. So many species are going to be, um, many species are going to not be found within a cladogram because they've gone extinct. So um, that happens sometimes when you're looking at uh, building cladograms of things like dinosaurs. So many of those things are now extinct and they won't show up in a modern day cladogram. So this is a cladogram showing you uh, the cladogram for primates. And we, again, we build this uh, based on uh, DNA sequences. And uh, we try to get the best, uh, you know, the best classification scheme that we possibly can. So, um, so that's a human one. And you can see that humans and chimpanzees have, uh, share a common ancestor. So you can see it right here, a branching point. Now, you know, uh, you know, I don't know if you think that you're closely related to a chimp, but you do share 98% of your DNA in common with chimpanzees. Uh, we can donate blood to chimpanzees, or they can donate blood to us. We, say, we have the same blood types. Uh, we have the common, uh, very common structures involved with that as well. So, um, you know, we share a common ancestor with gorillas, and you can see the branching point right there. Again, we don't just base this based on belief, but we use evidence to suggest that. Both DNA evidence, amino acid sequence evidence, fossil record, and we use uh, the common structure, so comparative anatomy for making these particular judgments. So take a minute and answer these questions uh, based on this, uh, this cladogram over here that you see. If you can't see it that well, then maybe you'll take a minute or so uh, after this video lecture 
and, uh, and look at it on PowerPoint and just let the slide be a little bit larger for you. So what common, what animal is most closely related to the squirrel? What animals are most closely related to humans and old world monkeys? Tarsiers share a common ancestor with which animal? Elephant shrews, elephants, manatee, and dugongs all share a common ancestor. Which animal derived from that common ancestor? Now you should be able to answer these questions. And you know, I'll have one of the tests, so possibly one that looks similar to this, and ask you questions about what things are related to what, what, which things are clades, which are nodes. So be very familiar with them how to do this. So you can stop the video and try that. If not, I'm going to go ahead and give you the answers. So there's the answers there that you can see um, to make sure you have the correct answers. Now, what makes phylogenies, these evolutionary relationships, really quite complex, complex and difficult to do is that genes are shared in common with each other. Genes are actually transmitted and carried from one organism to another. So viruses can insert genes into you, and uh, bacteria can pick up genes, we can pick up genes. So it's very complex to figure out um, where you know, genes originally came from and to, to build phylogenies because of this stuff called horizontal gene transfer. But you know, we keep trying to do the best we can. As scientists, what we try to do is um, develop new techniques. We try to make things more and more uh, accurate as time goes on. And so things change in science all the time. That's personally what I like about the, the field of science is that, you know, as new information comes in, it changes, it adapts, it makes things uh, more um, accurate and uh, it has the ability to correct itself. So um, we'll continue to do that and uh, make things more accurate as time goes on. So what we're going to do uh, in the future lectures is we're going to now go to talking about protists. We're going to go and, uh, and talk about um, uh, fungi, and uh, we're going to talk about plants and animals, and learn a little bit about those particular groups. So as usual, if you have uh, questions, if you have uh, comments, make sure you go online. You can talk to other students. You can talk to me via email. Um, but I look forward to hearing some of your thoughts about what you're learning. So I wish you a good day. Make sure you do your study guides. Make sure you keep up with your work. Make sure you dedicate time to uh, studying hard and getting all your work accomplished. Remember, you have due dates for everything, and you don't want to pass those due dates. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.